Jesus Christ said, I will build my church. For more than 2,000 years, he's been doing all that he promised. Today, his church remains an assembly of his saints, providing a place for worship, fellowship, and instruction. In a world that often feels isolated and alone, church remains a place to connect. It's a place to call home. We're so glad you've chosen to connect with the family of believers at Campus Church in the Crown Center at Pensacola Christian College, as together we rejoice in the Lord. Take your Bible, if you would, and join me today in the book of Romans chapter number two. Romans chapter number two. In just a few moments, we'll begin in verse number 17. Romans two, verse number 17. A current New York Times best-selling author, his name is Daniel Pink. He wrote something that I found honestly quite interesting and, and I'd never thought about it. The idea is not itself novel, but to put it in these terms had some novelty or something that was somewhat startling when, when I first read it. He's writing on management. He's not, to my knowledge, a believer, a follower of Christ, but he's writing on principles and such for improving your managerial skills. And Pink wrote the following. The more efficient you are at doing the wrong thing, so you're processing, and if you're, if you're connected and thinking, then process it in these terms. The more efficient you are at doing the wrong thing, the wronger you become. It is much better to do the right thing wronger than the wrong thing righter. Now, by the way, my, my spelling dictionary in Word was going crazy through this statement, just so we're all aware. He said, if you do the right thing wrong and correct it, you get better. Sometimes what we're doing in our lives, and it certainly can be in a myriad of different things, we're doing the wrong thing and we try to improve how we're doing the wrong thing. And so we're, we're getting, in a sense, pardon the English, but righter at doing wrong. We're perfecting the wrongness of a thing. I mean, haven't you ever been engaged in something before where you're, you're working on something and finally the person who comes and says, hey, what are you doing? Well, well I'm doing exactly what you told me to do, but in, in reality, you were not. And so you were doing something that was not only not helping, but maybe even hurting the situation. At times, religion, or better said, more accurately stated, man-made religion, or what we might call the form of religion, has been perfected. And the Apostle Paul knew personally the perfection of the form. In Galatians chapter 1, verse number 14, he said that he profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Really what he's saying is I was really good at doing the wrong thing and I profited. I was better at doing the wrong thing than some other people were, were good at doing the wrong thing. If we're only perfecting the form then we're just getting better at doing the wrong thing. Now, I'm not advocating that we do the right thing in the wrong way, but wouldn't it be better to do the right thing, albeit imperfectly, rather than doing the wrong thing wonderfully well? John Phillips said that the heathen is a man with a perverted religion. He said the hypocrite is a man with a pretended religion. And the Hebrew represents the man with a powerless religion. None of those obviously are good options for any. No matter which one fit, the heathen, the hypocrite, or the Hebrew, they were all in need of help. And the sad part is they, they didn't really know it. One pastor wrote, the most frequent facade that men erect between themselves and God, strangely enough, is religion. Do you remember the old westerns that used to be produced and, and you would see this incredible old western town 
And the, the scenes would unfold and you'd see someone walk out of the bank or out of the jail or, or out of the hotel and, and you'd see this whole Western town, but occasionally through some documentary or maybe a, a, a behind the scenes window, you'd see that the old Western town was just a facade. It, it looked real, it presented something that was almost convincing but it was propped up by supports. There, there was really nothing there. In a sense, you could be outside and open the door to go into the bank and still be outside. It was just a facade. I know we are still in what we've referred to as the dark backdrop of sin. Paul leaves no, in a sense, some. Um, self-worth stone unturned. Those who had taken pride in self and those who had taken some pride in their self-made religion or their self-made stature, Paul says, before we can go to that which is so beautiful, we have to accurately paint the, the very dark backdrop of sin. Man-made religion knows what a walk with God is supposed to look like. It attempts to go to the end product with the necessary foundational elements strangely absent. So it ends up doing the wrong thing quite well. Your Bibles are open right now to Romans chapter 2. Let's begin reading in verse number 17. Romans chapter 2, verse 17, the Bible says, Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge." And of the truth in the law. Thou therefore, which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. Sadly, with, with even the very best of intentions, there are times when the, the very thing we think we should be doing is exactly the wrong thing to do. It was December 14th, 1799, the day that George Washington died. This would not be unfamiliar to most that are in here. Uh, Washington had been out riding and um, the day before, he was um, just, you know, overseeing, doing the work of a large plantation, the grounds that he owned. And so he'd been out riding and he comes back. It was miserable weather and so he was soaked. It said that he didn't change his clothes immediately. He, he didn't want to be late for dinner so he dined in his wet clothes. And then late that night, Washington began to experience trouble breathing. So he called for a man that assisted him and he asked him to do something that you and I today would find somewhat backwards. His name was Albin Rawlings, and he asked Rawlings to bleed him. Now, bloodletting was somewhat common. It was a standard form of medical practice in Washington's day. And so, so Albin came in, and, and this was the first of the bleedings that Washington ex experienced. His doctors were then called. A team of doctors actually came and attended to his care. Through the next eight hours, Washington was bled an additional four times. It's estimated that Washington, through the five times he was bled, lost nearly 40% of his body's blood. 
Most today say that a person can die by losing 25% of their blood, 50% of their blood is absolutely fatal, and 40% most of the time results in a fatality to those who lose that amount of blood. But they were doing it with the best of intentions. Nobody wanted to see a 69-year-old first president of the United States die through bleeding, but they bled him five times. Isn't it interesting that at times, our very best of intentions, we're not trying to do the wrong thing. In fact, we're we're trying to do the right thing. We're, We're sincere in our efforts. But at times, our sincerity does not overcome the wrongness of a thing. In the passage that is before us, Paul is targeting the religious crowd Now, I'm going to say what I think should be obvious to us, and and that is we are a religious crowd. How many of you came to personally know Jesus Christ before the age of 10? Raise your hand, please. That, That is the vast majority of people that are present in this building. We have grown up knowing songs and situations and the form of the worship of God. I don't think that there is anything in and of that that is innately wrong. But if we don't get some foundational things wrong, then the form that is intended to point us to God, even as Judaism had a form that was intended to point people to God, can be the very thing that takes us away from the same, takes us away from the true worship of God. So Paul is targeting this religious crowd. They felt secure, they felt superior, but their hypocritical religion had actually made them separated. So let's take a look. The first thing we'll see here is they felt secure. Look at the first few words of Romans chapter 2, again, verse number 17. They felt secure, and the Bible says here, Behold, thou art called a Jew. Well, why did they feel secure? First of all, because they relished their name. They took some sense of national pride that we are Jews. Now, before we go any further, please note, I do think that there is a place for some some pride, so to speak, for lack of a better term, in your nation, your heritage, where you're from. The Bible even gives us some, some, some invitation to the same. Well, they they took pride in the fact that we have the name Jew. Now, this was one of basically three names that they had. One name that we'd be familiar with was a Hebrew. A Hebrew. That was really first applied to Abraham. It means, the, the title means one from beyond. Abraham crosses the river. He starts this journey with God. And so Hebrew, they had that name as well because, of course, it was their language, the language they spoke. But Hebrew was one name. And then there's another name that we'd be familiar with, and that is an Israelite. An Israelite. We call them the nation of Israel. Well, well they got that because one of their, their fathers, you know, there's father Abraham, and then Jacob, one of the fathers. Jacob has this wrestling match with God, and, and God changes his name. He says, thou shalt henceforth no more be called Jacob, but now Israel. Israel, prince with God. So Israel, this this makes sense. We call the nation the the children of Israel. And then Jew. Jew Jew is actually a shortened form of one of the, the 12 tribes, the tribe of Judah. And so it's an abbreviated form, not Judah, but just Jew. This became a title that was applied to the nation after the Babylonian captivity. When they came out of the captivity, there was now this this national title that they took on. They're all now Jews. The, the, The name Judah means one who is praised. One who is praised. And I think that they like this title, Jew. This was their name. They were the chosen people. And they took some sense of pride in this. And and certainly, they were chosen. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 14, verse number 2, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself. Listen, above all the nations that are upon the earth. 
They are clearly a nation that was chosen by God to be a people that demonstrated something special. They ultimately took that to mean that by their birth, they are secure. Sadly, they failed to realize that God had chosen them to be a light in a dark world, showing all the special relationship that comes from a relationship with God. But your birth does not mean that you have secured some kind of spiritual position. Our birth lands us all on equal footing. Galatians 3.28 there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. We're again reminded that the gospel is the great equalizer of all mankind. Later, we're going to address some of the advantages that are going to be given to the nation of Israel. That are not to be confused as an advantage to the individual in Israel. I know we're, we're laying some groundwork, and I hope you're processing. There are some advantages. Hey, listen, I'm part of the nation of Israel. Wonderful. Does that mean you get an individual pass on some things? And the answer is no. You're going to stand on your own two feet before Almighty God. To us, Paul may be saying something like this. You call yourself a Christian, a church member, a deacon, a teacher, a good person. But a self-ascribed title is not the security of your eternal reward. No one will be able to show their Baptist card at the gate of heaven and expect immediate entrance. And Paul wasn't finished speaking in the most controversial of terms. Later in this same chapter, in fact, look in your Bible a little bit later. Look down at Romans 2, down at verses 28 and 29. Just look a little bit past where we're at in our text. And notice what he says here. He says, for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Ooh, wow. Now this is going to stir major controversy to a Jewish reader. He says, he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. Now to any Jew, them's fighting words, okay? There are certain words that you might say to another person, and if they say that, man, it is take off the coat because we're going at it, okay? But Paul just said, hey, listen, you're not a Jew just because you have adhered to the outward standards. <sighs> Boy, okay, you better back this up, Paul, or you better backtrack that statement because them's fighting words. Look a little bit further. He doesn't stop there. Verse 29. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Remember again the, the, the title Jew. This is the shortened form of Judah, which means praise. Paul is using a little play on words that is not missed by his audience. He says, you call yourself a Jew, praised. But I'm going to tell you, there is a true one to be praised that's not just adhering to the facade, to the thing that's supposed to be a picture that points me to the greater. He says, no, 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 no. There is actually one who is to be praised, who hasn't just adhered to the letter, the picture, the form, but something has actually gotten to this person's heart. Why are these people so secure? Well, because they relied on their name. We have the title Jew. Paul just removes that from underneath them. Why do they feel secure? Because they relied on the law. We have the law. Look in your Bible again, Romans chapter 2, verse number 17. Behold, thou art called a Jew and restest in the law and makest thy boast of God and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. Okay, did you notice he says, you're resting in the law. They place their confidence in the law and their ability to keep it. Well, th that would have been fine if they could have perfectly kept the law. So that's okay. Listen, are you perfectly adhering to all the law of God? Well, many Jews would have said, yes, even from my youth, I have upheld all of these. And Paul's about to pull that rug out from underneath them. 
Do you know what the apostle Paul is saying? He said, you're resting in the law. You feel like, hey, I am, I am resting. Look, look here, the law is going to hold me. And you go to sit down. And let me tell you, Paul just pulls that chair out from underneath him. As cruel as that may sound, they felt like the law is going to hold me up. Well, well, sadly, the law can't hold you up. The only thing the law can do is, in a very real sense, condemn you because you haven't perfectly adhered to the law. The Jews had the Torah, the law of God as it was given to Moses. They had the additional laws added by their rabbis, their Pharisees. That They would do no work on the Sabbath. They didn't wear mixed fabrics. They, they wouldn't eat pork. They, they didn't plow with differing breeds, harness to the same plow. They didn't sow mixed seed and so on. They kept the form and they were resting on it. What are they doing? Well, they relied on their name. They relied on the law. They also had this, this sense of security because of their rehearsing of God. Can I want you to see this statement again in verse number 17. Behold, thou art called a Jew and restest in the law and makest thy boast of God. Here, for the first time in Romans, the apostle uses the verb to boast or to brag, and he uses it often. The Jews were bragging about their relationship with God, although it appears they, they didn't really have one. They got caught up in the loop of boasting about their exclusive relationship with God. It really wasn't boasting in God, but in the fact that God belonged to them. It was actually a strange twist of using God to praise themselves. Isn't that interesting? Have you ever seen people who, who boast in their relationship with God? What, what we have in God. But, but really, they're not boasting in God. They're boasting, in a sense, in their exclusive relationship with God. And Paul is, again, targeting these who are doing the, 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 what they think is the right thing, but they're doing the wrong thing and maybe what many would say the right way. James chapter four, verse number 16. They're rehearsing their God, but James says this, but now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. You're taking glory in your own bragging. Well, let me tell you about my God. Really, you're not telling us anything about your God. You're just telling us about your relationship, your perceived relationship with your God. Romans 2.23, thou makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God. He said, you're bragging again about something, but the very thing you're bragging about, you're actually using as a disservice to God. Did you, did you ever have a friend who was always bragging about their uncle or whoever that was, I mean, you mentioned anything. And, oh yeah, well, mine is better than, and, and oh yeah, well, my uncle and my friend. And no matter what you said, there's some boast that has to come in. Do you know what the Jews were doing? It didn't matter who had what. Nobody has what they have. We have a name. We have a law. And we are boasting in God although they truly were not. This brought about a feeling not only of security, but also of what we would identify as superiority. Look a little bit further. They felt secure and they felt superior. Look at verse number 18. And knowest his will and approvest the things that are more excellent being instructed out of the law. The word instructed out of the law. It's catecheo, catecheo. We would get to catechize or, or, a, or a catechisma. We, we would get this idea of a catechism. Like, okay, I'm going to catechize something. I'm going to organize something in such a way that it can be formally taught. The Jews used the catechism to instruct. It usually began with a question and then it resolved in an answer. It was a formal, healthy, good way to impart information and instruction. They had a formal education in the things of God. Clearly to them, they are doing just fine. They had their knowledge. They also saw themselves as guides. They felt superior. We have knowledge. They felt superior because we are guides. 
Listen, if you want to get from point A to point B, come see me. I know the way to go. Again, verse number 19, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness. Jews in general and the scribes and the Pharisees in particular considered themselves to be superior mentors of the community in spiritual and moral matters. Listen, if, if anyone needs to know what to do or how to do it, the Jews have the answer. Okay, to, to guide, you yourself need light. They assumed this as well. They assumed that we are a light of them which are in darkness. Why did they feel superior? Well, because we have knowledge. We are the light. We are the guides. And then they also saw themselves as teachers. We're the teachers. Look at verse number 20. Romans chapter 2, verse number 20. An instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and the truth in the law. Paul uses an expression here, the form of knowledge and of truth. The form. R really what he's saying, you have the pictures of truth, but you haven't gone beyond the picture. Okay, a, a wedding ring to put one on my finger doesn't make me married, but it pictures the same. I can wear a stethoscope around my neck, but it, it doesn't make me a medical doctor or a nurse. I can wear a hard hat, but it doesn't make me a construction foreman. I can pull one of my dad's old shirts from his policing days out of the closet and put it on, but it doesn't make me a, a sergeant. It, it's just the form. Something beyond the form has to be real in my life before I can be called this or that or the other. And the Jews said, hey, listen, we've got what is necessary. No, you, you just have the form. The Jews didn't have the reality. They were so deluded that they elevated themselves to a position of teacher or what the Bible would refer to as masters. James reminds us of this, my brethren, be not many masters, that is, don't be many teachers. Why? Knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. The word master there, it means teacher. Over and over again, the disciples are going to use, in fact, if you, if you do a simple cursory search on this, you see that the disciples preferred the name for Jesus, master, the, the scribes, even the Pharisees would go when conversing with Jesus and they would say, master, Teacher, do you know what title now the Jews had taken for themselves? We are the masters. We are the teachers. We are the ones who can distribute the knowledge. This is the term they had taken for themselves. We're the learned, the professors of purity, the teachers of truth, the masters of morality. Jesus said the disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. And to that, the Jews would have said, amen. The disciple is not above his master. The problem is the Jews didn't see themselves as disciple. They saw themselves as master. You know, I think that the Jews, in very real terms, they had something that was not exposed to the light. They were really comfortable with their religion. My, isn't this beautiful until exposed to the light? I oftentimes that I can deceive myself into thinking that I'm in pretty good shape myself. I, I do this, I do that, I, I don't do this, and I clearly don't do that. And I think I'm okay. I'm secure. Maybe even superior until exposed to the light. Paul is about to expose those who felt secure and who felt superior. Notice what takes place now where Paul reveals that they are actually separated from the one they claim, they claim to have exclusive access and rights to. They were separated, separated from the truth and from God. What a challenging place the Jews find themselves in and they didn't realize it. In a real sense, they had become very good at the wrong thing. 
the trail they were attempting to lead others down was what we might refer to as the greatest red herring ever. Have you ever heard of that expression before, a red herring? A red herring is some attempt to distract someone who's on a trail, they're heading somewhere, and ooh, I don't want them to go there, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead them on a different trail, distract them from concluding, coming to some conclusion about the thought they were immediately thinking. We, we do it with little children. It's easy, I think, at times with kids. M- maybe a husband and wife are having a conversation, and she says, sweetheart, did you fix the garage door? Did you do something with your hair? It's strikingly beautiful, okay? And do you know what the Jews are doing? It's as if, in a sense, they're trying to use this red herring. The, the term is, is under some, you know, confusion as to where did it really start from. But most say that the term came from those who are trying to escape a pursuit. So they're being pursued by the law. Justice is closing in, and they take a red herring you know, a dead fish, and they they would try to confuse the area by dragging that red herring on a different trail and causing those pursuing, the dogs pursuing, to to take a false trail. Well, there's no red herring with God. I I mean, he he knows me. He knows the, the thoughts and intents of my heart. There's no taking him down a, a differing altering trail. The Jews were attempting to say we're secure. We're superior. In some sense, they're attempting to throw God and man off their trail. They put themselves in the place of teacher of others, yet were in need of teaching themselves. Look at verse number 21. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou sayest that a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written." While the Jews condemned the sin of others, Paul said, look in the mirror, teacher. Look to yourself, guide. Jesus went so far as to take sin that they said, no, we we don't do that. Jesus took it to the heart level. They condemned the sin of adultery, but Jesus said, you're doing the same. Ye have heard that it hath been said of them of old, thou shalt not commit adultery. True. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Clearly there was a physical standard that the Jews collectively agreed was wrong. But what about the hidden man of the heart? One pastor said it this way, when a look turns into desire, you have crossed the line. Adultery in the heart is lust that mentally engages in fantasy. Adultery in the flesh is lust that carries out the fantasy. The sin has happened, not just in the physical act, but in the matter of the heart. Paul goes on to address the matter with the Jews that thought they were safe regarding the matter of idols. Perhaps the greatest challenge that Paul presents came from his asking the question, thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? This is a very serious expression. The word sacrilege here means to traffic in idols. Apparently it was rather common for Jews to take images that were religious relics from other godless nations and market them. The town clerk of Ephesus had this in mind when he said, for ye have brought hither these men which are neither robbers of churches. They haven't, they haven't taken the relics nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. The Jews were involved in commerce over character. Even if they're not touching the idol, oh, that, that's an image of gold. Just give us the gold. They, they didn't desire to guide anyone only to sit in judgment of others, condemning the unrighteousness of the Gentiles, excusing their own. 
while they saw themselves as the answer to the Gentiles' problems. Think about this. We are the answer to your problems, but we certainly don't want to share the answer with you. They not only despised the blind Gentiles, they were actually blind themselves. Do you remember what Jesus called the Pharisees? Matthew 23, 16, woe unto you, ye blind guides. Matthew 23, 24, ye blind guides, which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. The Jews felt secure. They felt superior. They were actually separated. With advantages come obligations, responsibilities. You and I have the advantage of a completed Bible. We have the guide of the Holy Spirit, the fellowship of saints. The question remains, are we living like it? When we live only lip service and not life service, we turn people away from the living Savior and deepen them in their own frustration and rejection of the truth. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles, Paul said to the Jews, through you. What is the the life we are living today saying to others? Are you living today with bitterness? You call yourself a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ. What instant continually replays itself in your mind? It may have happened days ago, weeks ago, or even years ago, but it is as fresh today as it was the day it happened. Bitterness is a sin that is impossible to contain. When we live with bitterness, we become living examples that the wrong done to us is greater than the power of the gospel to free us from the same. The gospel is not greater than the wrong that has been done to me, and I will not let that wrong die. Hebrews 12, 15 says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. It's as if he is saying, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, because you have not dealt with the matter of unresolved wrong. Are you a gossip? Where no wood is, the fire goeth out. So where there is no talebearer, the strife ceaseth. The word talebearer is a compound word. It means one who shares secrets. He goes around talking, walking about, sharing secrets. Did you hear about? What value does that have for this person? other than enlisting them to a cause that may be yours. And so now we we go about sowing discord even among the brethren. Are you simply unkind to others? Simply unkind. The Bible says that Jesus went about doing good. Ephesians 4, 32, and be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. We could go on and on, but I suppose that maybe each of us could name our own sin, whereby the name of God could be blasphemed among the Gentiles, or what we might refer to today as the unbelievers. The reality is Romans 8.37 applies to every believer who's ever stepped foot on the face of the earth. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him, through Christ who loved us. Man-made religion is never enough. It gives us a false sense of security, a feeling of superiority, and we may be good at it, but we're only getting better at the wrong thing. Even as true Christians, we can easily go astray. When I become more focused on the failures and problems and sin of others than I do the failures and problems and sin of self, I may be dangerously close to causing the name of God to be blasphemed through me. May God be our true helper, our strength, And may we place no confidence, no security, no superiority 
in the flesh. We're glad you joined us for Rejoice in the Lord as we've discovered answers to life's questions from God's Word. Messages are also available on iTunes when you search Rejoice TV or find us on YouTube by searching Rejoice in the Lord. Your financial support is vital to keep Rejoice on the air. Your tax-deductible gift enables this viewer-supported ministry to spread the gospel around the world. Encouraging Christians and reaching people for Jesus. This is Rejoice in the Lord.